Therefore, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I love you. seated this morning. I know from time to time, uh, we've all probably experienced the sense or the feeling that uh, something's just not right. Have you ever had that sense before? And man, it's easy in the world today to kind of get that. You just, you hear a report about what's happening around the world, in Israel today, in our own nation, maybe even in your own family, maybe in your own life from time to time, and you think, whoo, something's just not right. Now, I know sometimes we feel that feeling or sense that sense, and it's because God is trying to say something to us. He's wanting to draw us to himself, or he's wanting us to turn from a sin in our life, or he's wanting us to have greater faith in our life. I know that happens, and I get all that. But sometimes, even after you have prayed, even after you have read scripture, even after you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, even after you have You have repented of your sin and you're walking in as close fellowship with the Lord as you know how. There are still times that you sense something is just not right. I just don't feel fulfilled here. I don't feel like this is actually home anymore. There's something else I want. There's something greater. There's something more. And you start looking for it and you start chasing it and It just doesn't seem to come along. Even though we believe in this gospel that tells us we have peace, even though we believe in Jesus who gives us that peace, there's still something here that you just get to the end of the day and you say, it's just something doesn't feel right. Amen? You know what I'm talking about? I think every person has experienced that in some way. Believer, non-believer. If you're a non-believer, I can tell you the only way you'll ever find any semblance of an answer to that question is in Jesus Christ. If you're a believer, that is still true. It's in Jesus Christ that we find our hope while we wait. But it's a funny thing that we all do because we want to somehow soothe that ache within us. We want to somehow not feel that sense of something's not right. I'm not satisfied. I'm not fulfilled. Something just isn't right here. And people do a lot of things to try to deal with that. Sometimes people self-medicate to deal with that because no one likes that feeling. I get it. So people chase after drink. They chase after food. They chase after pleasure. They chase after drugs. They do anything they can to make that feeling go away. People get out and they overspend their money in an attempt to make it go away. People get out there and they overwork in trying to make that feeling go away. People start questioning their life to make that feeling go away. Some people make some wrong conclusions and say, well, I must be married to the wrong person. Some people say, I must be living in the wrong place. Some people say, I must believe the wrong thing. I need to make some radical changes to my life because I just can't find an answer to this ache inside. Some people go to a therapist. Some people chase all kind of self-medication, overthinking, second-guessing everything in their life, but there's an ache inside that won't go away. I'm here to tell you that As a follower of Jesus Christ, there is an ache inside us that on this side of heaven will never ever go away because you and I as followers of Jesus Christ are made for heaven. 
And only then and there will that ache finally be satisfied. Amen? Our message today is called Something is Just Not Right. Amen? It doesn't matter how much you prayed, believed, confessed, and walked in obedience, there's still something in this earth that's just not right. You look around, you look at family situations, and you say, something's just not right, hello? You look around at what's going on in our nation, something's just not right. You look at this world today, something's just not right, and the ache just gets louder, and you think, there's got to be an answer to this. There's got to be something more than all the things that I've tried. I'm glad you're asking about that. Amen. Hey, turn in your Bibles today to Romans chapter 8. We're going to see what Paul had to say about it because Paul had the same ache. He had the same longing inside, even though he's kind of one of the superheroes of the Bible, even though he was one of the ones of the New Testament who saw things greater than anybody else had ever seen, he wrote and tells us. Even though all of that had happened to him, there was still something inside that just said, it just doesn't seem right. Something just seems off. I'm just longing for something more. And Romans 8, Paul describes that starting in verse 18. Here's what he says. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, I think we can all identify with the sufferings of this present time. We can all understand that part. We can all understand they're not worthy to be compared to what is going to be one day. But this part at the end of this verse right here is just a little bit intriguing to me. That there's a glory that's to come and it shall be revealed, not just in heaven, but in us. Ooh, that just got personal all of a sudden. There's something coming that's not just in heaven, but is in us. There's a glory coming for us. There's something bigger, weightier, more magnificent, more wondrous than you could have ever imagined. And it's going to happen in you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. There's a glory to come, something powerful to come, something you haven't seen yet, something you don't even understand yet, something you've not ever even experienced yet, something that's being kept under wraps until the day that you are face to face with Jesus Christ. And Paul goes on and he says, here's what this is. For the earnest expectation of the creation, man, that's a lot of words right there. We're gonna look at them eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Paul is saying, there is something written into the fiber of creation, into the rocks and the trees and the atmosphere and the cows and the dogs and the cats and the plants and everything that God created. There's something in creation that has been written there, placed by God, and today it is in this state of earnest expectation. It is longing for something. It is expecting something to happen. It's not just a maybe, it's a gonna be. It's going to happen. And he says, written into the planet, into the fiber of the planet's existence, into the animal kingdom, the geological realm, the biological realm, and the atmospheric realm is a is a longing that creation has. And it's waiting for what this verse says, the revealing of the sons of God. Mm. Sons of God. That is every believer who has put their faith in Jesus Christ. You are a son and daughter of God. And we are not yet what we will be then. Amen? Right? I hope this is not all there is to the whole deal, right? Right? There's more. There's more to come. There's a glory to come. And Paul says here that creation itself has some understanding of this. And it is longing. It's eagerly waiting. This idea of uh, eagerly waiting, it means to, uh, to stretch your neck out to see. Like you're straining to see something. And he's saying here creation is eagerly waiting for a day that is to come when the sons and daughters of God will step into their glory for the revealing of the sons of God. 
For the day that sin's curse is removed and that we see Jesus face to face and we are no longer clothed in this mortal body that gets tired, that hurts, that can get ill, that can get tired and weak, hello, and one day we'll die. But there's coming a day when we will be removed from this, or it'll be removed from us, and we will stand face to face, and then we will receive a new body in heaven. Amen? Amen? So he says creation is waiting for this. Well, why is creation waiting for this? Paul's so good at walking us through this. Watch this. The next part of verse 20 says, for the creation was subjected to futility. Now, Paul's a smart man, and Paul uses a lot of words and big words, words that we don't always use every day. But here's what Paul is saying. When Adam sinned in the beginning, which, by the way, God created man and woman. We didn't evolve on this planet. He created them and put them in the garden, and they were clothed with glory initially, and they walked with God. But God placed in that garden an opportunity for them to obey him. And instead, they chose to eat the fruit, Adam did, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God had said, do not eat from this tree. I want you to trust me for what is the knowledge of good and evil. But Adam took and ate that fruit. And because he is the head of all those who have been born... Yeah, he's in your family line. He's way back up there at the beginning. Because he did that, everybody born after him would be born with a nature that is sinful, that is decaying, that is bent toward evil, that needs to be resurrected. Amen? Like we saw this morning. And Paul says, all of creation, when that happened, was subjected to futility. In other words, creation hadn't done anything wrong. The trees, the grass, the clouds, the, the water, the agriculture hadn't done anything wrong. But Adam had sinned. But because of that, all of creation fell under a curse. The whole planet became something that it was not originally. You see, God originally had, in, had created the garden and the planet full of beauty and glory. Man walked with God. There was intimacy. There was closeness. There was no uncertainty of the goodness of God. But not only was there peace with man and God, creation was different. Did you know that when God originally created the planet and the garden, that the animals were not at odds with one another. They weren't out to attack and devour one another. You didn't have to worry about your dog chasing your cat around the room. It wasn't going to happen. You didn't have to worry about one animal even attacking you. That just wasn't going to happen because there was no need for self-protection and the need to be aware that one animal could eat another animal or that one animal could eat you. That was not the case in the garden. There were no thorns. There was no poison ivy, praise God. There were no plants that caused illness in the garden because God created everything as good. In fact, one of the fascinating things you see is that the trees, even in the garden, were not only good for you physically, but they had spiritual properties to them. Now, that's kind of weird. Can you imagine eating a peach and it doing something for you spiritually? But we know this is true because there was in the garden the tree of life that they could eat from, and then there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they were not supposed to eat from. There were trees who had spiritual properties to them. He's like, well, bite me off a piece of that apple. I'll take some closeness with God with that, you know? Not the apple that Adam bought or ate. It wasn't an apple, by the way. That's just a story that someone's made up. It never says in the Bible it was an apple. Are you with me? We can imagine having fruit and it have a spiritual property to it. 
But this is what we find in Scripture. There was all, all, also at the same time, all the leaves and seeds and fruit were all good for you. There weren't any that were poisonous. No stinging insects, no biting animals, no disease, no ailments, no sickness. There was no separation between the realm of God and the realm of man. There was no distance between us and God. There was the full awareness that God walked amongst them as Adam and Eve. Now stay with me, I'm gonna get a little sciency here, all right? I know people think and sometimes say, that the Bible is not a science book and you know science contradicts the Bible. Well, that's just wrong. Science hasn't caught up with the Bible. The Bible is far ahead of science and if people today would understand that God is the one who created all things, they would see that science actually confirms the creation of God and creation that God had here on planet Earth, amen? Here's the deal. When Adam sinned, the world came under a curse and when that happened, something came into being that had not before. We know it today as the law of entropy. It's part of the second law of thermodynamics. That things move from order to chaos. That things move from life to decay. And you know this because if you leave a piece of uncooked chicken out on your counter for about three days, you're going to know it, right? Hello? It doesn't turn back into a chicken. It doesn't fry itself and it doesn't turn into something delicious. It gets nasty. You leave some kind of fruit out on your counter for two weeks and it gets weird. Now, here's the weird exception to this. Heather and I bought an apple six weeks ago, set it on our kitchen counter in the window. That thing looks as good today as it did six weeks ago. That ought to make you nervous about the apples you're buying. If that apple still looks the same six weeks later, that thing's been genetically modified. You better stay away from that thing. Hello? Stuff moves from life to death, from order to disorder. This is, how, this is what happened when the planet came under a curse. Nobody is getting younger in their life. Hello? Nobody at 80 is having baby soft skin anymore. I wish, hello, you know? It just doesn't work that way. We move from order to disorder, from life to decay. This is the way it works. And so this is what happened when the planet came under the curse of sin. Now, it's a real slap in the face to me to the whole idea of evolution, because the whole, the whole idea behind evolution is, oh no, we're evolving and getting better and better. Look, we improve from this life form to this life form to this life form. Look, it's all just getting better and better and better. Really? Tell me about that piece of chicken that's on your counter now for two weeks. Is that getting better and better and better? No. It ought to make you ask some questions about what's going on with this whole idea of evolution. Hello? Okay, you should ask some questions. You should do some research. In the garden, there was originally no storms, no tornadoes, no hurricanes, no earthquakes. There's nothing to fear because God had made all things good. The soil produced food and without much effort, the Bible tells us. Now, even the stars and planets were different when God created them. Job 38 says that when God created the heavens, that the stars sang together. Now, I've never heard a star sing. But can you imagine if the heavens declared the glory of God in such a way that in a night sky, when you looked up, you didn't just see beautiful display of lights, but you heard the glorious music of heaven this is how creation was before the curse came on the earth. The atmosphere was different because in the garden, there was the design that man would live forever. In the garden, food grew larger. 
You see some of the leftovers of this as you get into um, when the children of God go into the promised land and it says there they found grapes that they had to carry on stalks. This is a remnant, a leftover of that process. This is why people in early pages of the scripture lived hundreds of years. They were living post-curse and now it has shortened to the point that we live 80, 90 years. We don't live 300, 500, 600 years. But this is how God originally designed the earth. It was intended to be a place of life. It gave off life, and it was a place where man would live forever. So I want to illustrate this today in uh, a couple of scenes. And if you have some notes, you might want to, to draw along today and keep track of what's happening here, because here, here God created the earth, and he created it good. He created it this way until man sinned. And when he did, when man sinned, when Adam chose to defiantly disobey God, when he chose to do what he wanted to do instead of what God wanted him to do, the earth fell under a curse. It would no longer be what it once was. Now we would find a world in chaos and disorder. And this is the world that we live in today. We were not meant to have decay and death for us to live as temporal shells on this earth. We are, and the planet, or the planet is under curse because of sin. Now Paul goes on in verse 20. He says that here's what we also know about creation. It happened not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. In other words, creation didn't do anything wrong. It was Adam who sinned. And it was God who caused the planet to then become something different than it was. To be put into a limitation, a cursed state. But the Bible says here that God did this in hope. That there was something he was looking toward. That there was another day coming. That there was something bigger that God had in mind. Let's follow along with Paul here in verse 21. And he says, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Wow. He says there's coming a day when what God has created will actually be delivered from the bondage of corruption. In other words, the planet one day will be saved. How about that? It will no longer be under the curse. It will be brought into the existence it was designed for. It will once again give off life. It will once again have the glory of God on it. I'm going to give you a, a teaser into next week. We often think of heaven as being somewhere out there and far away. Come back next week and you're going to see that heaven is not near as far away as you might have thought it was supposed to be. That's next week. But creation is going to be delivered from the bondage that it's in, from all the chaos and the turmoil and the storms and the earthquakes and the disease and the ailments and the fighting and the tension and the animal tension and the animal kingdom and the geological tension and the plates shifting on the earth, all of that stuff. It's going to be delivered, but into what? Look at verse 21 into the glorious liberty of the children of God. What? He says, on that day, when that happens, when you get the new heaven and new earth, it'll be when the children of God, you and I, are brought into our place of brand new liberty. When we are ultimately set free. Amen? On that day, he said, creation will be free. God will restore all things. 
Every bit of faith that we hold to now because we can't see will become sight. Every bit of longing that we have, we will experience in Jesus. There'll be no more war. There'll be no more chaos. There'll be only Jesus reigning. There'll be no more tears. There'll be no more Satan tempting us. There'll be no evil spirits plaguing us. There'll be only the children of God with Jesus himself on a new earth. Mm. You know, what's interesting to me is that people talk today about, oh man, we need to save the planet. We need to, we need to do all we can and protect ourselves because of climate change. In fact, there are those who say the greatest existential threat facing us today is climate change and global warming. Really? The last time I looked, the greatest threat facing our planet today is the unrighteousness and evil that's in man that needs to be redeemed by Jesus Christ. Amen? And here's the deal. I want to be responsible with the part of the planet that I have been given to live on. But you can work all you want, all your life, doing all you can, and you are not going to save this planet. It is under a curse because of the sin of man, and it will only find its freedom and peace as a planet whenever it is redeemed by Jesus Christ himself. Only then. It's not up to us to try to save the planet. So when people tell you the greatest existential threat facing our planet today is global warming, you need to look out. Because it is not our responsibility, nor is it in our power to save anything or anybody. Only God can do that. Amen? Again, responsible? Yes. Us? A savior for this planet? Get out of here. It's not happening. And I don't want to... I don't want to go down political agendas that have that as the end goal philosophy even. Because that end goal philosophy doesn't include Jesus Christ as the one who redeems the planet. But that's for another time. Let's go on here. And here's what Paul says in verse 22. He says, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Mm. He says, creation is like a woman who is in labor. Creation is expecting something. Creation is expecting something different than what it is. I don't know if you've ever been with a woman who's in labor, in the latter stages of labor. She's not comfortable. She's tense. She's, she's nervous. She's walking around. She's uncomfortable with how she is. She's ready for something to break loose. She's ready for something to come out different. She's ready to give birth. If she's in the latter stages of labor, she wants to see the life that is in her come out of her. And the Bible here says that creation is like that, that the planet is like something that's pregnant. It's got inside it a new life that is designed, that is been given by God, but right now it's in the labor pangs of it. It's under duress. It's tense. That's why there's storms today. That's why there's earthquakes today. That's why there's disease today. That's why there are ailments today, because the earth is uncomfortable. It's tense. It's ready to bring forth some life This isn't the way it was supposed to be. And so it's ready for delivery. And Paul says, here's here's the truth. As much as we know all of that is true about creation, as much as we can all identify with this as true for the physical, geographical, atmospheric creation, Paul says this. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Whoa. Paul says, as much as you're watching the planet and it's uncomfortable, I don't like this, I'm ready to bring forth new life, like a mother in labor, he says, you and I are the same way. 
He says, you and I have within us a sense of groaning, a sense of longing, a sense of there's got to be more than this. And so that feeling that you and I feel that says inside, there's got to be more. I'm just not really ultimately satisfied. I got questions that have not been answered. I got longings that are not fulfilled. That is from God. It has been placed in you the moment you were born again. The Spirit of God, when you were saved, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Spirit came to live in you and it started changing you. Amen? You started tasting peace and you said, whoa, this whole peace with God, I, this is awesome. I'm feeling, I'm feeling love from God. This is great. I'm sensing joy come into me. This is awesome. I've, I know I'm forgiven. This is glorious. I know I'm blessed. I know that God has a purpose for my life. As great as all of that is, Paul says, oh, that's just the appetizer. That's just the first fruit of more to come. You want to know a definition of the first fruits? Here it is. Get ready. It's the first fruits. Man, I studied that long. If a farmer goes and he plants and he's going he's gonna to go harvest what he brings in, the first fruits are the first fruits that he gathers. And he knows, oh, there's a whole lot more coming. These are just my first fruits. I don't say, well, first fruits, that's it, done. Plow it all down, boys. No, he knows there's more to come. So, we have this planet that's under a curse, and it is in labor pangs together until now, as Paul said. It's under a curse. Well, what Jesus did is he recognized that the planet and you and I were under a curse. And so he sent his son Jesus to become, the Bible says, a curse for us. On the cross, Jesus took the curse. He took what you and I deserved and what was on us and the planet. He took the punishment, the curse of God, so that you and I, when we believe in him, could take the blessing of God. He became sin, the Bible says, so that you and I might could be free. And so what happens here is a process begins of redemption. You have been redeemed. And God is in the process of making all things new. Amen? And inside, there is this joy for what God has done in us. But there's also an awareness of, I think I just, I feel like I just tasted the appetizer, but there's a whole meal coming. I'm still hungry. Anybody? I, I, I've tasted some good things, but it just seems like there's got to be more. Uh-huh. Now you're getting it. You mean there's going to be in me just a little sense of dissatisfaction on this earth? Mm-hmm. You mean that's going to always be with me? Yes. Because you and I are like the planet. We're longing and laboring for something else to come forth, and God himself will bring it about. You've had the appetizer, but you ought to see the meal that's coming. You've had the first part of the trip. We hadn't even got to the destination yet. You've experienced the dating part of the relationship, but wait till the wedding day. Hello? You just tasted the first fruit, and there's so much more to come. And Paul says, because of this, in verse 23, he says, we are eagerly, Make sure I've said everything I want to say here. We are eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. This. I'm waiting for this to be redeemed. My spirit has been redeemed. I'm, I belong to Christ. I am confident I will spend eternity with him. But man, I'm waiting for this whole thing to get redeemed. It gets tired it wants its way. It's needy. It's whiny. It wants to be fed multiple times a day. It wants to sleep all the time. It wants to kick back in a recliner and eat Twinkies. Come on. Come on, 
somebody. We got stuff to do for God. And it's like, I ain't doing it, ain't doing it. I'm ready for this thing. I'm ready for this to get redeemed. And Paul says, that day's coming. Eagerly awaiting the adoption, the redemption of the body. My own body, your body. And inside us is an ache for that day. You're meant to live with that longing. Now Paul goes on, he says, for we were saved in this hope. He says, this is, this is why you came to Christ. This is part of it at least. You sensed within you that something is not right. You sensed within you that I don't like what I've done. I don't like what's been done to me. I don't like where my life is headed. And out of that, you heard the gospel. You heard Jesus calling you and offering you hope. And you chose to identify with him in his death and resurrection. What Martha and Anthony did this morning was recognize, I don't like who I was. Jesus has offered me life. I'm going to identify with Jesus. Isn't it sad to see a world today where people are choosing to identify with such deviant behavior and emptiness and futility and a path that ends up without peace, hope, joy, and love? But Jesus says, identify with me and you'll find life because there's coming a day when there is something new that will happen here. You see, the planet will be redeemed. You and I will be ultimately redeemed. And Jesus himself will be Lord of all. He will be the king. He will reign. And we will trust in him and be with him forever because he is our God. And in that day, you and I will experience a new body, a new life. We will experience hope. This body will be resurrected, but the planet itself will also be redeemed. The planet itself will also experience new life, and it will be a place of glory. And we wait for that day. We wait for it with hope. Not, well, we'll see what happens. No, hope that says, I'm confident it's going to happen. Verse 24, Paul goes on, he says, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? You can't hope for something you already got in your hand. If you... If you choose to go to a restaurant after this service today and you sit down and you eat, maybe you go to El Phoenix and you're eating and you're eating good. When you're finished, you don't say, well, I hope we go to El Phoenix today. <laughs> What's wrong with you? You just ate a whole plate of food. You wouldn't because it would already be in your possession. Look, you and I don't have in our full possession yet what's going to be one day. And so we hope for it. You don't hope for something that you already see. Verse 25, Paul says, but if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Boy, we wait and we wait for that day. We long for that day and we know it's coming. So, to the question, what do you do when you have this sense something's not right? I don't feel ultimately satisfied. There's got to be more. Here's what the Bible tells us. You're exactly right. That is the spirit within you saying, this is just the appetizer. Get ready for the meal. So this morning, our encouragement ought to be, there's coming a day when we'll finally and fully be set free. But until that day, whew, we wait with confidence. We encourage one another. We pray for one another. And we sing about that day together. Amen? Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you. 
in that while we were sinners, you sent your son to die for us so that the curse could be lifted from us, so that there could be the hope and full redemption of not just the spirit within us, but our body as well, that we might fully know and be fully set free in your presence. I thank you that that day is coming. We can believe that with confidence and certainty. And we long for that day. We hope for that day. We set our affections on that day now. And all of our dissatisfaction, we find satisfied there. So we, along with Jesus, drop our anchor in heaven, longing for that day to be fully and finally set free. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.